Welcome back, ChemStars. Today we're going to look at polyatomic ionic naming. So if you're watching this video, that means you've already watched the simple binary ionic naming and the transition metal ionic naming. All of those same rules apply here, but we're adding one extra layer of complexity. So the first part, we need to look at what actually is a polyatomic ion. So the prefix poly means many. Word atomic, that's referring to atoms. And then ion, that means a charged particle. So if you're in level one chem, you already have this list and you've been working on memorizing them. Level two chem, your teacher will be passing this out to you. So polyatomic ions, you're going to get a list of these. And they are ions that are made up of a couple of atoms, two, three, four atoms or more. And they are covalently bonded together, but they themselves are a charged unit that works together. So they're one single thing. So we have 27 we're going to use most commonly. And on the back of that sheet, there's some extra ions listed. So make sure you have that handy while we're going over these notes. Okay, so how do they work? Only NH4 has a positive charge, acts like a cation. All of the rest act like anions. They have a negative charge. So we're just going to use the same rules, but now we're going to be using polyatomics. Like we've done before, you have to know how to write your formulas. Know the charges and crisscross if necessary. Remember that we have to get the positives and the negatives to equal out to zero. If there's more than one polyatomic ion um, needed by crisscrossing, you have to put parentheses before and then a subscript after it. So we'll look at an example. So if we want to write the formulas for sodium hydroxide, the first thing is sodium. Look that up. Sodium, it's a group one metal. So if you're not sure, check the periodic table. Sodium's right here. It's always going to be a one plus charge. So we know that sodium's a one plus. Then we've got to find hydroxide. If that looks a little different to you, it's a good clue. It's probably on your polyatomic ion list. So hydroxide is an OH minus, OH1 minus. Now, here's what I like to do. I like to always put my polyatomics in parentheses, and then I only get rid of them at the end if I don't need them. So when I look at these, if I crisscross, I'd get one and one, and you can see plus one and negative one cancels out. So my formula for sodium hydroxide would be NaOH. Now we look at that rule. Um, if there's more than one polyatomic, we need parentheses. So do we need parentheses here? No. You can kind of imagine that the parentheses are always there. We just don't write them if the subscripts are one. So it's going to be NaOH. Let's try an example where you do need to keep the parentheses. So let's try calcium hydroxide next. Calcium, go to your periodic table. Calcium's in column two. It gets a two plus charge. And then hydroxide's that same polyatomic ion we just had before. So hydroxide has that one minus. Now let's do the crisscross or look at your picture. Do the pluses and the negatives cancel out? No, I've got a two plus. I need to get a two minus, so we'll have to have two of those hydroxides. So we're going to need one calcium, and then we're going to need, oops, I'm trying to keep my color coding consistent for you. Then we're going to need two hydroxides. So that two is really important and we need to keep it here because what it's telling us is that there are two of the OH groups. So when we write our final formula, it's just going to be CaOH2. And what this looks like is that there's going to be a calcium, a hydroxide, and a hydroxide. If you instead wrote CaOH2, you would think that you had a calcium, an oxygen, and then two hydrogen. So look, are those pictures the same? No, that's why we need those parentheses saying that there are two of those groups. So all the rules are the same, let's just review them. First step is always name the cation first. If it's a transition metal, remember like we learned before, you need a Roman numeral, but there's a couple exception, um, exceptions, so don't forget those. Remember zinc is always a two plus, it doesn't need a Roman numeral. Cadmium, also always a two plus, and silver, always a one plus, and they don't need Roman numerals. Next, you're going to um, name the anion. Most of these end with eight or eight. So here's a couple of examples. Let's look at SO4, two minus, and SO3, two minus. If you go to your polyatomic ion list, we can find those right here. Those are named sulfate and sulfite. So SO4 would be sulfate, and SO3 will be sulfite. 
OH hydroxide and CN minus cyanide are the only ones that end in ide. The ide ending means that there's no oxygen. Now we can kind of see a pattern, 8, O4, and ite. 8 will have one more oxygen than the ites. So everything's exactly the same we've learned before. We just are adding that complexity of the polyatomic ions. So here's some examples I'll go over with you before you do some independent practice. So keep in mind the always, always. That's something you can use to refer to the metals that always have the same charge. So metals that always have the same charge. That's like your group ones, your group twos, aluminum, cadmium, silver, and zinc. And then your wishy-washy, those are your transition metals. They can make several different charges, and you have to make sure you give them a Roman numeral. Okay, so let's go through and look at a couple of these. Sodium and then SO4. When you see it, put parentheses around it. So when I'm looking, I see Na, sodium. And does sodium need a Roman numeral? If you're not sure, check your periodic table. Nope, it's in column one. It's always a one plus, so we just call it sodium. Now, SO4. We wrote that down up here, but if you're not sure what SO4 is, you go to your polyatomic ion sheet and you see SO4, name for that is sulfate. So this name is simply sodium sulfate. That's all you got to do. Let's try next one. AG, that is silver. Now when you see silver, a little alarm bell should go off because you know that silver is a transition metal, but silver has an always charge of one plus. So silver does not need a Roman numeral. And then we have NO3. That looks new and complex, so you want to consult your polyatomic ion table, and we're going to look for NO3. NO3 is nitrate. So this name is going to be silver nitrate. Let's try another one. Uh-oh. Here we have iron. Iron is one of those wishy-washy transition metals, so we're going to leave like a, a blank here for our Roman numeral. Now, PO4, put that in parentheses, that is your polyatomic. Go to your polyatomic ion sheet, and you can find phosphate here is PO4, 3 minus. So we're going to just write that, write that down off to the side. Phosphate is PO4, 3 minus. So this is going to be iron something, phosphate. So iron does need a Roman numeral. So what must its charge be? Well, if you look at this, there's one phosphate, and phosphate is PO4, 3 minus. And there is one iron. We don't know iron's charge, but we do know that the whole thing will equal out to zero. So if phosphate's a three minus, that, mean that, that means that iron has to be a three plus. This will be Roman numeral three, iron three phosphate. Okay, we got one more to try here on this page. CO3 and we got CO. Okay, so let's take a look here. So CO, CO is cobalt. Now I'm not sure if that one needs a Roman numeral or not, so let's go to our periodic table and find cobalt. Cobalt is right here. So yep, transition metal. It's not one of my always, always. It's a wishy-washy one, so we got to figure out what the charge on cobalt is. So cobalt, we're going to leave a space for its Roman numeral, and we've got a polyatomic ion here. See how it's in parentheses already for us? So go to your polyatomic ion sheet sheet, and CO3 2 minus, that is carbonate. So CO3 2 minus is carbonate's charge. And we're going to jot that down on the side again, too. So we need to keep in mind that carbonate's charge is 2 minus. This is cobalt something carbonate. So how do we figure out what the charge on cobalt is? Carbonate is a 2 minus. Look at that. If we don't do the crisscross, cobalt has 2. That 2 probably came from carbonate's charge. And then there's 3 carbonate. That probably came from cobalt's charge. So let's try this. Let's see if cobalt 3 carbonate works. So if this is cobalt 3 carbonate, and that means each cobalt has a charge of 3 plus. So cobalt 3 plus. Now there's two of them. I'm going to write it twice, twice cobalt 3 plus. And now there's three carbonates. So we got carbonate with a 2 minus, and there are three of them. So we've got carbonate with a 2 minus, and we've got carbonate with a 2 minus. Let's add up those charges. We've got on the anion side, we've got a 6 minus, and on the cation side, we've got a 6 plus. 6 plus and 6 minus, that checks out, goes out to 0, so it is cobalt 3 carbonate. So the rules are the same, just we have to add, consider the polyatomics, the transition metals, and remember, we always want to get the charge down to 0. So let's go ahead and flip the page. So um, I want to do, um, like, maybe one of these with you, then I'll have you pause the video and come back and check your solutions. So let's try the first one together. Iron 3 sulfite. 
When you see that, iron 3, they're literally telling you the charge. So iron's charge is 3 plus sulfite. That looks unfamiliar, so you go to your polyatomic ion list. Sulfite is going to be right here. H, or no, sulfite, SO3, 2 minus. So SO3, 2 minus. We want to always keep it in parentheses. We'll just get rid of them at the end if we need to. So look at the charges, 3 plus, 2 minus. Do those cancel out? Nope, that means we got a crisscross. Or just look at it. We need to get the positive and negative charges to equal out. So sulfite's charge is 2. That means I'll need 2 iron. I'm writing sulfite again, but keeping it in parentheses. Iron's charge is 3. That means I'll need 3 sulfite. And then do a quick double check. If there's 2 iron, that's going to give me a 6 plus. And now if there's three sulfite, SO3, two minus, and SO3, two minus, that gives me a six minus. So six plus, six minus, that checks out. This is my final formula. So I want you to pause the video, try these next four, and then come back and see how you did. Good work, ChemStars. Let's check your work. So ammonium, NH4, one plus, sulfide, S2 minus. To make a compound, that formula is NH4, two, outside the parentheses, S. We need the parentheses because there are multiple of the ammonium cations. Aluminum acetate. Take a look at that one. Aluminum is always a 3 plus. Acetate is C2H3O2 minus 1 minus. Do our little crisscross. Here's your final formula. You need to keep that 3 on the outside of the parentheses because there are multiple of that polyatomic ion. Then we've got sodium hydrogen carbonate. Here are your two ions. There's just one of each, so we can go ahead and drop those parentheses. Calcium nitrite. We do need to keep the parentheses because we need two nitrites. And then copper one hydroxide, that's an example where you can go ahead and drop the parentheses again. If you had trouble with these ones, go back and watch the rules again and have some good questions to ask tomorrow in class. So now we're going to try some writing some of the names. I'll do one with you, then have you pause, and we'll go from there. Um, I'll pick one of the trickier ones. Let's see. So here we have Fe, so you know it's going to be iron. Iron always needs a Roman numeral. We're not sure what the Roman numeral is yet. And OH. If you're not sure, check your list, and you'll find that OH is hydroxide, and it's a 1 minus, so we got to make a note of that and write that down. So make a note off to the side, OH 1 minus, so it's iron something, hydroxide. If hydroxide is a 1 minus, and there's two of them, that means right here we've got a 2 minus charge. So what does the charge have to be on iron to get equal to 0? Well, it's going to have to be a 2 plus. And if iron has a 2 plus car charge, it's called iron 2 hydroxide. So I've done one of the more complicated examples with you. I want you to go through now, pause the video, and try the rest of them on this section. So let's look over your answers here. Um, first one, potassium is always a 1 plus, so we just say potassium. Look up sulfate, sulfite on your periodic table, or on your polyatomic ion list, and it's going to be potassium sulfite. Let's look across here. Magnesium sulfide, this one's simple, no transition, no polyatomics. We already did number two. Let's look at number six. Magnesium is always a two plus. Sulfate is always a two minus. That's why there's just one of them there. You can visualize that we always would have the polyatomic written in parentheses, but we don't need them if there's only one. Number three, we have manganese four nitrate. That one's a little bit trickier. When you look up nitrate, nitrate's charge is a one minus. There's four of them. That means on the anion side, we've got a four minus charge. There's only one cation. The whole cation side has have a charge of 4 plus, so that means it's manganese 4. IV is the Roman numeral for 4. Magnesium sulfate. Magnesium is always a 2 plus. Sulfate, you look it up. And remember, the parentheses are always there. We just don't write them if there's only one. Um, last row here. Ammonium phosphate. So you look up phosphate. Phosphate's charge is 3 minus. Ammonium is a 1 plus, so everything checks out there. And then the last one to look at. Copper 2 acetate. So how did I know it was copper 2? You check your polyatomic ion list, and acetate's charge is a 1 minus. So when I'm looking at this formula, there's two of them. So a 1 minus times 2, there's a 2 minus charge on the anion side. There has to be a 2 plus charge on the cation side. There's only one copper, so that one copper has to have that whole 2 plus charge. That makes it copper 2 acetate. So we're done with all of our ionic naming rules. Um, you can keep watching the next videos to get the acid naming rules. Bye, guys.